Right. Welcome to the African Youth Perspective with Usman Touré. These are a series of events that we're going to be releasing by Monday. Today, my name is Patrick Karakezi and I'm co-hosting with Ben Hiradokunda. And today we are hosting a guy that needs no introduction. Guess his name is Usman Touré. Usman Touré is a young pan Africanist from the Gambia. Usman, actually, it's so amazing that we're back together. Last time, I think about six months ago, we had a conversation. We were talking about how you refused to go to the UK, to Canada, to America, but you said to come to study in London. We brought you back here. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much. Well, it was a matter of choice, and now it is a reality. Yeah, you know, I think that mine was, that was my mind most is the commitment. You said you want to be in London, you want to study in London, and you pursued. And that's like basically, if you need something, just pay for the parts. Wow, amazing. And it's really the topic of today. We're trying to explore what we have in Africa education system. We know that um, it is the basis upon which we get skills, we obtain knowledge, we obtain wisdom to be able to develop our community, our society, and the Africa that we want. What is wrong with what we have in the education system? Yes. What is wrong with what we have is basically it was not designed to fit the purpose. As a result of this, we have not taken our time to wait and analyze on the way forward with the education system. So in most cases, countries have decolonized themselves, per se, politically, but in terms of education and institution, even with the constitutions among many African countries, they have not taken their time to look into it. And that is the only problem that I have with the education system. I'm just saying it is wrong because we are graduating people and yet they are not adding value to the society. They are not solving the societal problems, but they are adding up to the problem. Mm -hmm. So what we can do now is to make a look at the future, to make a look on the Africans and the future of the African youth. Then we tailor something that is solely African but also fit for purpose. Something that is so African, that means we need to have as many more perspectives for the youth yeah. included. Yes, many more perspectives and the youth included. But one thing also that is very important is for us to understand that Africa, before the opening up, by allowing individuals to come in, we had norms, we had values, mm -hmm. we had systems, we had skill sets. Mm -hmm. Among young African societies and young people, have to pass through mm -hmm. and they were productive to their societies but today these are things that we have seen yeah. as things that are out of date things that people no longer need to focus on yeah. and the education system more of just program individuals to be servicing and what are we servicing you can see a very skillful individual mm -hmm. denied every opportunity to reali realize their talent by the school system they ended up in a front desk. Yeah. As secretaries, as, as secretaries, as clerks, mm -hmm. and these are everything that all of us are going in for. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a market that can accommodate every individual. Mm -hmm. So that has killed skills in Africa, it has killed creativity and innovation in Africa, mm -hmm. and that makes it difficult because the school system, which was supposed to be the solution side, in making sure that we produce individuals that come and fix the societal problems, mm -hmm. now we just graduate and add up to the problem. Becoming unemployed, yeah. creating, we have seen how crime increases in many African societies. Mm -hmm. We have seen the fact that people not having the ability to live for themselves and decent livelihood for themselves yeah. have in fact propelled them to pick up arms against fellow Africans. Mm -hmm. So, a lot is wrong with the education system, but I believe that there is a solution. And the solution is, us as young Africans mm -hmm. need to make a post and say, what do we want for ourselves in the future? Mm -hmm. And what Africa do we look forward to? And once we can question these things, then therefore we can come up mm -hmm. with a blueprint to say, skills, knowledge driven, solution centers, is what the schools, is what institutions, is what universities in Africa has to be built with and graduate from the mastery of theories 
you no longer have the benefit costs. Mm -hmm. You can add words and not be looking for more to say that well. The education system being not simple from the African perspective, uh, if I'm thinking history in terms of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. even in schools where entrepreneurship is focused on, uh, you realize that most of what they're teaching is theoretical. They are giving you examples that don't necessarily exist. They tell you teamwork in the market and what X, Y, Z, how it's supposed to do this, maybe in this cash flow statement. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, that's and that's an idea. It's just more of a simulation and it's something that we can run apply to your life. And as you're saying, if we are looking for a way forward uh, and we are planning to teach our people and Africans to create solutions which will start with the actual problems that our society are facing, I feel like it's high time schools to start working on actual problems that are existing in society. Mm -hmm. Then we develop solutions for actual problems that are on the ground rather than working on simulations that are always in textbooks from the Western world. Yes, I mean, um, just to like substantiate that, let me tell you this. We have what we call in education learning by association. Mm -hmm. You learn by relating to your environment. Mm -hmm. And most of the books that we read, the information might not be false, but it is applicable in the society in which the book was written, mm -hmm. or in which the theory was coming from. Mm -hmm. In most cases, you can see an individual or a whole book that talks about you building home, going to the market, do this particular thing, doing that. It is applicable in that society because the child that is being educated through that way has the opportunity to get up every day, receive a minimum amount of cash, walk to a market, do something. But now, to apply that in the average African that is living on the abject poverty, has no idea about what market structure is, has no idea about what caste is, like they find it difficult to access, they find it difficult to have or to see social amenities in public. Mm -hmm. They have little ideas about knowledge, about servicing and etc. They must be met in the context in which they are. Mm -hmm. And that is teaching them based on the environment in which they are. It's showing them that there is the need for them to come up with solutions. The average young child in Congo walk to school stepping on minerals and has no idea about how these minerals can be pawned to the benefit of himself or herself in the society in which they are. Yet, these are things that people must be educated in. We have to have a mastery of our environment. We have to have a mastery of our systems. And we must be going to school with the idea of moving forward. What value can we add to the resources present mm -hmm. and how it can be beneficial for the future of the country? This must be cooperated in the school system. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something that is telling me very perfectly. You say that after colonialism, that's kind of 1960, we colonized ourselves politically, per se, as you said. And then we left the system of empowerment still controlled by the colonial people. Yeah, I mean, we can look at it. Many African countries up to date are celebrating independence. As we speak today, there is an African country celebrating an independence. But you tend to put this question, what independence are we celebrating? I mean, you're celebrating independence when 70% of the food that you eat in your country is imported. I mean, in the 1980s, this is exactly what Thomas Sankara said. For you to live under imperialism or neocolonialism, you don't even have to go far. Just look at your dining table. Mm -hmm. If the food you're eating, everything is imported, you're definitely living under colonialism. Because people must be able to have a sustainable economy tailored in the interest of the African continent. And we need to have a political structure that is tailored in the interest of Africans and not necessarily to be influenced by global politics. Today, if you look at the international powers or the balance of international powers, more especially in politics, what role those African states play in? Very minimal. 
despite the fact that we all understand that all the resources today movement the global economies is coming from Africa we can even graduate from the issue of resources in Africa being taken by outsiders let us look at technology for instance we are not the controllers of tech but we are servicing every tech giant in the world because without Africa they cannot survive we are the biggest consumers of data today but yet we do not control it so you come to understand that when it comes to independence for a nation to be it must be able to tailor its education system in the reality of the country without being influenced by outsiders it must be able to organize it, its politics in the reality of the country without being influenced by the outsiders likewise on the economy mm. and institutions and etc but today in every sector in Africa you see that colonialism still exists mm. neocolonialism is still present mm. all forms of ways through which outsiders can use to influence our internal structures mm. is happening today yeah, in, in a part of scholars argue that colonialism never was in scope, but it has got to rearrange. Well, yes. it used to come directly, yeah. they're coming in a little more tactically. Yeah. Yes, now they do not have to come directly in a sense that if you look at the British indirect world system, um, they know that they have shortage of nationals, they don't have enough bridges to be walking around Africa to come on. So they introduced the indirect system. And the sole objective of the indirect system which was an indirect rule, which was introduced by the British in Nigeria, by John Durga, you go to the Gambia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, etc. They had a focus that they were not present, but to do that, they just need few Africans torn to behave, think like a British, to do that function for them. So you have few British that were present supervising these Africans to administer on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And this system never changed. Even at independence, the French had to make a force and pick few Africans that were moderates, amalgamated into a French culture and everything, to be leaders in specific African countries who were all answerable to the French government, except very few mm -hmm. who were earlier on eliminated by the same individual. Today, if you look at our whole systems, these are the people we call today the comparable groups. They think, you see them, they look like Africans, they are in institutions, they are in offices, they go to work every day, but they don't necessarily represent Africans. Mm -hmm. They still represent an outsider. And this is what undermines our independence. Because we exchange our dignity, mm -hmm. our principle, with paper money. And that is really affecting the independence of African states. Uh, and when I'm thinking about decolonizing, uh, maybe you speak about the economy, to me, you feel as though it's not a very hard task to pull off. Um, when you talked about African movement, technology a lot, today more Africans all sell force more than water. Um, and I feel like it can be as simple as we countries coming together and saying, you know, we have a lot of Africans that are buying mobile phones today. Can we at least have a, can we at least assemble this mobile phone in Africa to increase our GDP? We don't need we don't need we don't need to manufacture them from scratch. As simple as assembling them. And I wonder like where does it go wrong? Because to me it feels as though the solutions are all, somehow all over the place. Are we is it because we are corrupt? Like what goes wrong I don't know. I mean, you know, skill set is skill set is one thing, but mindset is another thing. Now, we have it somewhere where most of us get it wrong. Mm. That today, for me to look different in the society, I would prefer to have an Apple phone, maybe iPhone 12, iPhone 11, than to buy a Mara phone from the one. And they all do the same purpose. Not understanding that when iPhone 4 or iPhone 5 were cut up, that was the building stage. It all has to come from somewhere. But today with all the African celebrities, people that most of us look as reference, mm -hmm. 
they don't appreciate African poets. When, imagine just one singer, like an artist, holding a microphone can inspire, can inspire thousands of Africans to go and buy it. But they would prefer to have 10 iPhones on their bodies and it's still they don't represent anything because no matter what it's still coming from an outside mm -hmm. now coming down to the fact that the need to assemble the need to build up things within africa even packaging alone packaging alone is billions billions that it, of, of, of dollars or whatever that it can add mm -hmm. to the african economy just by packaging stuff but today, how many countries are willing to do it? If you look at ECOWAS, for instance, because the protocols are, if you package within an ECOWAS country, then the goods can freely enter another country without having like those custom duties and etc. Mm -hmm. But even rice, we cannot package it in Gambia. So that tells you that there is a big challenge among African states, mm -hmm. because it is as if people are not set for the desired development that we all have. Mm. And these are entities that we can explore, put the African youth there, solve the problem of un unemployment, solve the problem of you know dependency, but at the same time make the African to have a dignity and respect. Mm. Because once we do so, we no longer have to be beggars, but we have our economy planned within our systems for the sustainability of our resources, our development, and etc. Yeah, and maybe I just want to correct something. You know, I feel like Africa isn't just supposed to be packaging or assembly. Yeah. We are supposed to be creative, right? Definitely. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm definitely in support of the fact that we need to be creative. Yeah. And that is, ex it is happening in, in many African countries, though. Yeah. Like we were just talking about some of the phones, now we've seen computers and etc. being manufactured or created in Africa. Yeah. That is a good thing. But I'm just telling you that we are doing a lot of things mm -hmm. that could have even been cheaper right. to us and we are still not tapping into it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think iPhone is going up to China to assemble? Mm -hmm. I mean, that solves unemployment. How many Chinese are today employed by iPhone or by Apple? Mm -hmm. So that is some of the things that we need to target mm -hmm. to make sure that some of the things that we don't have now we can just add small value, little value into it and save resources for our country. Mm. But equally groom those young Africans that are going to pick up the challenge right. in creating, in innovating, and making sure that the resources that we have, the mm. economy that we want to preserve is in the hands of Africans. Mm. And maybe just slightly back to education. So we have this system of education you know, within Africa definitely has really highlighted it's not Africa, it's not by Africans, it's not a first century, right? And I want us to look at what Africa had way before these people came and implemented their own systems. Why was Africa like? We could have we could have education, we could be learning, we could get it empowered. I can give you this historical background and you can definitely make your own research after this. Mm -hmm. In the Senegambia region, we had a group of individuals called the artisans. Mm. These were also known as the indigenous industries. And this is prior to the coming of the European, to the coming of the Arabs, and etc. Mm. People within that region had skills. They were manufacturing farm tools, farm equipment. They were making leather and stuff. We have the leather workers, we have the goldsmiths, we have the iron smiths different industries but these industries today they've all failed as a result of the opening up that africa did without focusing on protecting the local businesses or the small entities before the african child was given a skill by this group of individuals and they were very good at the things that they were doing one thing that i can tell you the african understood gold understood diamond, mm. understood iron, way before the Westerners. Europe 
only ended the dark ages when it came to Africa. Because when they were coming in, they found that there were these whole systems. Africans were beautiful, using resources to decorate the environment, having skill among young Africans. But we've opened up. And they understood that in order for them to take the resources they needed to disconnect us from our environment, to show us that, well, this you're doing is not even relevant. You just have to go to school. Be so good when you compose yourself in a language, maybe English, maybe French, Portuguese, etc. And the rest, forget it. And while we were concentrated on mastering every theory from the West, our resources were equally living on an exponential rate outside of the continent. So this really affected the whole education structure. Mm -hmm. And Africans can really do something by just having to go back to say, this were skills present, this were market present. I can, you must have heard the history of Kunta Kinte. Kunta Kinte was taken from the Gambia in a place called Jufre or Al Qaeda now because it is two communities that are almost together. These were towns at the time because they were commercial areas where different people come in to do business along the coast of the River Gambia. If you go there now, all you see is buildings that have been destroyed. Like, it is as if it has never been significant mm. in the economy of the Gambia. That tells you how colonialism have destroyed financial structures, financial mm. hubs within Africa, and put in place their own financial and trade centers. Because what they did is, they sifted it from these regions, move it, to the coastal areas so that they can easily do business with the African. And that is what made today all African economy to be extract because all our ports are facing Europe. And it is not an internal trade. So basically we don't do business among ourselves, we don't integrate among ourselves, but we extract resources outside of Africa to Europe. And that really undermines every aspect of the African economy. And that is how it equally affects the education system mm -hmm. because people will go to school and yet they do not create jobs. Interesting. That's what's happening in Africa. And speaking about six years since we last had all this, you know, we live in independence and we're still struggling with the same narratives. I feel like as Africans, we have a role to play. And Perhaps that's what we'll be ending with. I'll be asking Osman, I feel like we already ran it so fast. And Osman, I feel like Africans as a youth, as an Africans, as an Africans, and we are, you know, we have a role to play in shaping this. And what we see most of the universities, most of the high schools, different spaces, they are trying to distill Western theories, you know, come up with something that they feel can be able to help us solve African problems. I mean, solve African problems. And in the long run, they're making us look like we cannot create our own from scratch. We are continuously adopting. And if we adopt from the West, it means that we always have to go back to the masterpiece to learn and never go wrong on our own, right? So what should we be doing as Africans or as young people to ensure that all these systems are from scratch? You can come up with um, this. One of the interesting papers that I read uh, some time ago was Decolonizing African Universities by Professor Mahmoud Mongani. Mm. Um, you know, with the inspiration from uh, Uganda, South Africa, mm -hmm. and etc. We have to understand that we need to go to universities with projects identified, mm -hmm. people focused on doing things that are going to be relevant to our societies and decolonize the education system in universities in Africa. Mm -hmm. It is still like dependency, like you go to certain universities and you see an instructor using a book that was written 30 years ago as an economic system. Mm -hmm. I've seen people spend a lot of time explaining a theory that the actual author 
have in fact written all the books and contradicted him or herself on the same theory. Mm -hmm. And yet they are thinking, okay, because it was it has a white color, so automatically it's still a relevant book. Mm -hmm. This must be understood. Africans equally need to go into academia, start to write, mm -hmm. and I am thankful that even with these discussions that we have in today, I am doing my best to make sure that in the near future we have a book that explains all this and it will be accessible among African youths. Incredible. Right. And I, I thank you so much, Mr. I think we have been our very last segment. We are yeah. taking us for the last segment. It's only a few questions. You cannot think. You just come from this over. These are jokes. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first question would be you don't feel a dash for me, okay? I'll try. Alright. I'm fascinated by film um, development. Um, I guess you want me to have you know me. <laughs> I wanna <laughs> it's look at it I wanna look at it in a broader password okay. in, uh, in so, order to save the continent of all. Yeah. Um, my best book is maybe post development readings by by my kid and Victoria. You should be looking out for the most post development field. I feel like it's the best has ever been written. It's fine, most of the issues. Do you mind giving me the last one? <laughs> My African dream is uh, a prosperous Africa. A prosperous Africa. Right. So, we're down to the end of the African perspective. We will be having several of these conversations and what should we have done to make it possible? Yes, and to <laughs> our viewers, you know. Um, we get our own YouTube channel, so subscribe, like, and share. It is African Perspective, and it is for